Good evening and welcome. Um, and thank you all so much for coming this evening. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Karen Adler, and I'm the president of the Jewish Communal Fund. Um, and I am just really excited about this evening's program. Um, we've talked a lot at the Jewish Communal Fund about the kinds of things we can do to really enhance the experience for our fund holders. Um, and this program really represents um, one of many ideas, but I think one that is a particularly exciting idea. Um, we are very excited to have the panel here with us for a meaningful conversation um, about new trends in philanthropy. Giving circles are a somewhat new trend, although I think we'll hear from at least one of our panelists that they've been around for a little while, so we have some data and how they work. Um, we're honored to have with us today members of four different giving circles. Nancy Astor Fox, Debbie Cosgrove, Cliff Greenberg, David Steinhardt, and Felicia Herman, who will be moderating our conversation. But before we start our program, I would like to just take a few moments to talk a little bit about the Jewish Communal Fund. Many of you in the room are fund holders, but we are very pleased to have with us this evening people who aren't fund holders yet, but I'm confident that when they learn more about us, they will want to be. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, uh, the Jewish Communal Fund manages $1.4 billion in charitable assets from 3,100 funds. Donor-advised funds are the fastest growing charitable giving vehicle. According to the LA Times, it's the wave of the philanthropic future. A donor-advised fund at the Jewish Communal Fund is really easy to use. It's an efficient way to manage your charitable giving and maximize tax savings. It's similar to a charitable bank account. Funds can be opened with $1,800 for a children's or a bar bat mitzvah fund and $5,000 for a general fund. Fund holders receive the maximum tax deduction allowed by law and can grow the charitable assets in their funds tax-free. They can easily recommend grants to a wide range of nonprofit organizations, both within the Jewish community and the community at large. The Jewish Communal Fund manages group funds as well. These enable extended families, groups of friends, groups of people with similar interests to pool their funds to leverage their charitable impact. JCF will handle all the administrative work of these giving circles. As a personal supporter of the UJA Federation of New York, I take particular pride in the fact <coughs> that the fees from the Jewish, communal f that the Jewish Communal Fund gets enable us to make a $2 million gift each year to the Federation. In addition to that, through our special gift funds, we've been able to make special gifts to a vast variety of network agencies for special projects and programs. As the largest and most active network of Jewish donors in the country, we regularly offer opportunities for our network and guests to come together to learn about different topics and trends in the philanthropic world, ways to increase the impact of your giving. Giving Circles is just one of those, but one we're excited about. And I guess you must be too, because you're here this evening. Anyone can join a Giving Circle and, more about, and learn more about grant making, the not-for-profit not -profit sector, and their own values in the process. The Jewish Communal Fund is proud to facilitate several giving circles for our funders and we'd be happy to assist you if you are interested in starting your own. It is now my pleasure to introduce the moderator for the program, Felicia Herman. She will introduce each of our respected panelists. Felicia is the executive director of Natan, an organization that empowers givers by engaging them in giving circles inspired by Jewish values. The Natan Fund is a giving circle of young philanthropists supporting Jewish and Israeli social innovation through Amplifier, the Jewish Giving Circle movement, a field builder and resource for Jewish giving circles around the world. Felicia serves on the board of Bikurim, an incubator of new Jewish ideas, and the Safaria Project. She is a recipient of JFN's J.J. Greenberg Memorial Award 
and she holds a PhD in history. I don't know Felicia, but I've heard a lot about her, and I think we're really in for a treat this evening. I hope you all join me in welcoming Felicia. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. We're really glad to be here and um, really glad to have this terrific panel assembled today. These are some of the rock stars of the Jewish Giving Circle world, so you're in for a real treat. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes just talking to you about just what Giving Circles are, because I'm going to guess that there are people here who have never heard the term before. Maybe some people just came for the kosher wraps or who knows, but um, I want to tell you about the model a little bit because it's an incredibly powerful tool for philanthropy and is something that really has the, the potential to transform both the organizations that get supported through Giving Circles and the members of the Giving Circles themselves. And I'm really grateful to Jewish Communal Fund for hosting this conversation um, and just want to say a special thank you to Sue Dickman and to Michelle Leibowitz and really to the whole team um, really for this conversation, for so many other great conversations and for leading the Jewish Communal Fund um, and its fund holders in such exciting and powerful new directions. So everyone in this room, just by virtue of having been invited to this event, is philanthropic in some way. So we don't have to convince anyone of the importance of giving. Um, and we all know, I think, that in an ideal world, giving would be a really positive experience. And hopefully, you have had very positive experiences of giving. Experiences that re are rewarding and inspiring. And, the, and it's really important in the world for philanthropy to feel good to do. Because as we know, the world faces so many challenges that philanthropic investments can help to solve. And the more inspired, committed, passionate philanthropists we have, the more money will go out into the world to solve these problems. But I think, unfortunately, many times giving feels not so good. So feels sometimes like an imposition or an obligation, maybe a little haphazard or emotional, and sometimes pretty opaque, like where did my money go after all, and did it really make a difference when it got there? So we're going to introduce you to a model of giving that enables anyone at any giving level to have the kind of empowered and positive and thoughtful experience of giving that we know people really want. And this is through a giving circle. A giving circle is very simple. The model is very simple. It's just a group of people who get together, pool their charitable resources, and then decide together how they want to give their money away. We already have many different examples of giving circles in the Jewish community, even if they're not specifically called giving circles. Um, giving circle is kind of a catch-all term for a lot of things that have existed for a while. Um, things like independent giving circles, like Natan, and you'll, David's here from Natan, you'll be hearing more about Natan in a little while, and Nancy is here from the Acharai Fund in Philadelphia. There's a group called Slingshot. There are some independent giving circles that just kind of do their own thing. Then there are giving circles within federations. Cliff is going to talk about Solilim, which is really one of the biggest and oldest giving circles, Jewish giving circles, um, that has been part of UJ Federation of New York for 15 years, right? Yes, right, Laura? <laughs> yes. Um, there are women's foundations. Women's foundations um, have really pioneered this whole space of collective giving. And Debbie's going to talk about the Jewish Women's Foundation of New York. Um, people, women coming together, um, sometimes in an institution like a federation, sometimes independently, and often funding projects for that, that change the lives of women and girls. There are teen foundations. We don't have any here tonight, but you should know that there are over 120, I think, teen philanthropy programs in Jewish institutions around the country at summer camps and day schools. Um, in synagogues that are engaging teens in this powerful experience of philanthropy. And there are major funder collaboratives. Um, the Jewish Funders Network, for example, hosts several major donor collaboratives where foundations and, and substantial philanthropists come together around issues that are important to them, pool their funds, and collaboratively make a greater impact than any of them could have had on their own. So giving circles are a really young but a growing movement, both inside and outside the Jewish community. One of the fun things about 
um, engaging in this work of giving circles is that we've now met pe people from African American giving circles and Asian American giving circles. Um, really kind of any group that you can think of under the sun um, has some examples of giving circles. So David's going to tell you more about Natan in a bit, so I'm not going to tell you the details of Natan, except to say that um, the reason why I got involved in this whole giving circle experience is because my husband and I joined Natan. And pretty much from the beginning, we were hooked on this model of people coming together, learning from each other, funding innovative things. And the impact that Natan has had on our philanthropy is a kind of story that anyone on this panel can tell you. We now give much more than we used to. We give more regularly. We feel really good about our giving. We know where our money's going. And we're part of a community of people that intersect now personally, professionally, philanthropically. Natan has become a whole Jewish community for us and has totally transformed the way that we give. But Natan started from a very simple question. How could we inspire more people to give Jewishly? And while there are aspects of the way that Natan answered that question, there are some aspects that are unique to Natan that give Natan its particular flavor, we also have come to understand that the power of this model for inspiring people to give transcends any of the particular details that describe how Natan does its work. Giving circles are infinitely customizable. Each one of you could walk out of here tonight, start your own giving circle, focused on any issue that you were interested in with any group of people that you wanted to hang out with, giving any amount of money, and that would be a good thing. Giving circles encompass all of those differences. So you'll be hearing some of those stories tonight, and you'll, be, you'll come to understand, I hope, that the impact of the giving circle experience cuts across all of these differences. Research has shown that giving circle members give more give more strategically, are more involved in their communities, and give to a wider range of organizations than non-Giving Circle members. Giving Circle members are also more likely than non-members to advance a vision for change in their giving, to conduct research, to support grantees' general operating expenses, to check organizational performance data, and to consider race, class, gender, and other cultural differences when making their decisions. These are the kinds of givers that we should all aspire to be. And these are the kinds of givers that the world needs many more of if we're going to tackle the big challenges that are out there. So after a while, we came to the conclusion that we just simply needed more giving circles out in the world. And that even if Natan got very big, it wouldn't solve the problem because everybody should have the giving circle that most resonates for them. So over the past couple of years, we've joined together with dozens of partners around the world to build a giving circle movement to increase the number of giving circles that are inspired by Jewish values, and to create a network that strengthens circles over time by connecting them with resources and training and mentors and colleagues. And we've created a very big open tent that includes giving circles both that give to Jewish causes and Israeli causes, but also giving circles that are explicitly and substantially or substantively inspired by Jewish values, but that might give to any number of different kinds of causes. And we call this movement Amplifier. It's the, the name comes from the idea that if being in a giving circle amplifies the impact that any individual member can have in their giving, then how much more so would a network of giving circles amplify the impact of all of those giving circles? A network can provide some of the shared backbone resources that can make it as simple as possible for anyone to start up a giving circle and then to sustain it and strengthen it over time. So we have a couple of screenshots from the Amplifier website. This is our homepage. It's all very beautiful, by the way. Someone said the other day, it's the most beautiful website I've ever seen. So I figured that was it. I could go home. Our work was done. Um, we have a robust uh, well, this is our Giving Circle directory. So on the Giving Circle directory, so this is the first time that anyone has put in one place information about all the Jewishly inspired Giving Circles that there are. And there are 50 of them on there now. You're just seeing a couple of, um, a couple of pictures of them. Um, this enables Giving Circles to reach out to each other, to network, to ask each other for advice. Maybe you see that someone's funding a particular organization or a cause you care about. Maybe you want to join a giving circle um, that you find on here. This is a growing directory of giving circles. The organizational directory is also something that we're very proud of. There are 400 nonprofit organizations now that have submitted 
profiles in this directory. And if you're just a casual user of the site, you'll go onto this, you'll click on one of these organizations, and up will pop a brief description of them. So actually anybody, whether you join a giving circle or not, can use our directory as a tool to learn about organizations in issues that you care about. But if you're a member of a giving circle on the site, you don't just get the profile, you get a full common grant application. So now you and your giving circle can be searching for the kinds of issues that matter most to you, come across organizations, read about them, learn about them in really serious detail, and make grants to them without actually asking them to spend any more time on you than they already spent in submitting the original application. And offline, um, we have fun gatherings, conferences. Um, these are a couple pictures from conferences we've done now in Tel Aviv and in San Diego. And pop-up giving circles. So this is another way to think about it. Maybe you're not quite ready to commit fully um, to the giving circle experience. This is, these are pictures from a pop-up giving circle that we did in Tel Aviv. We're just in one night, in 90 minutes, 100 and something people donated $2,000, I think it was, it was 8,000 shekels, so $2,000, and then it was matched and then double matched. Um, and just in one night, they read through organizational profiles, they talked about their values, and together they gave, they decided on one organization to fund, one Israeli organization. And it was a ton of fun, and you can do this anywhere. We've done this in people's living rooms, and we've done it, as I said, with hundreds of people in different places. It's a great way to experience what it's like to be part of a giving circle. Um, and we have partnered with the Jewish Communal Fund on great events, or we partnered with organizations like the Jewish Communal Fund on great events like this, where we can start to introduce the model to a wide range of people to showcase how diverse it can be and really to try to encourage all of you to think about this as a vehicle for your philanthropy or to tell your friends or other people who you know are philanthropic about this kind of interesting new way to do philanthropy. So about that diversity of the model. So if I, I want to make sure that I turn this off without it going to my email. I'm going to unplug it. There we go. Um, great. Um, so as I said, we have four Giving Circle rock stars with us tonight from four of the biggest, um, most serious Giving Circles in North America. And they're each going to tell you their story. Um, they're going to do it quickly so that we can get a lot of information out into the room all at once. Um, I'm going to introduce you um, to all of them and then each of them is going to go take about five minutes to tell their story and then we'll talk to them, ask some questions and we'll open it up to the room for questions. Um, so Nancy Astor Fox is going to go first. Nancy is the Chief Development Officer of JEVS Human Services in Philadelphia. Previously, she served as the Associate Director of the Goethe and Kurt Klein Foundation, an organization that's dedicated to promoting tolerance, acceptance, and hope for youth throughout the country. In her volunteer life, Nancy works with the Jewish community through her involvement with the Jewish Federations of North America and the local Jewish Federation of Greater Philadelphia. She is co-founder of the Aharai Fund, the giving circle that she's going to talk about tonight, and of Fox's fight to raise funds and awareness for melanoma research and she serves on the leadership council of the Abramson Cancer Center at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. And if she doesn't talk about her most recent Israel trip um, in her remarks, you must go up and ask her about it afterwards. Uh, David Steinhardt's gonna go next. David is the managing partner of Worcester Capital Management, a money management firm based in New York, and he's the co-president of KCPS Clarity, a wealth management company based in Tel Aviv and New York. David is the chair of the Natan Board, the long-serving, long-suffering chair of the Natan Board, as a founding board member and actually really is one of the people who created Natan. Um, and he has been a member of more of Natan's grant committees than probably either of us can count. He graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with a BA in European History and he lives in Manhattan with his wife and two children and his tiny little dog. Debbie Cosgrove um, will go next. She currently sits as Grant's Chair of the Jewish Women's Foundation of New York and has been involved there for the past five years. In addition, she's on the board of UJ Federation of New York and sits on the UJA's Global Jewish Peoplehood Committee. In a few months, she will become the board chair of Immerse NYC, a community mikvah project. And if she doesn't talk about Immerse NYC in her remarks, you must come up to her afterwards and ask her about it. 
Debbie received a BA in elementary education from the University of Pennsylvania and a master's degree in Judaic studies from JTS. She's taught for several years at Jewish day schools, both in New York and Chicago, and she teaches several adult learning classes at Park Avenue Synagogue, where her husband, Elliot, is also the rabbi. And together, they have four adorable children. And last but not least, we'll be hearing from Cliff Greenberg, who is Senior Vice President, Director of Research, and Portfolio Manager at Barron Small Cap Fund, a $5 billion mutual fund focusing on long-term investing in small growth companies. Cliff presently serves on the boards of the UJA, the Samuel Waxman Cent uh, Cancer Research Foundation, Rock and Wrap It Up, an anti-poverty think tank with the best name I think I've ever heard, Rock and Wrap It Up, and Brothers for Life, a foundation helping injured Israeli soldiers. He is a founding member of Solalim, the giving circle that he's gonna talk about tonight, which is affiliated with the UJA Federation of New York, and that was started 15 years ago and is still going strong. He was born and raised on Long Island, received a BA from Cornell and a JD from Columbia University. So I think from a logistics staging kind of standpoint that maybe you should stand up here because otherwise the folks over here have an obstructed view. And so Nancy, I'm gonna give it to you to take it away. Thank you, it's so nice to be here and um, I wanna share a, a, an image with you. Picture a room with 12 kids, ages uh, 12 to 30 something. And they're talking about sustainability and bloated project budgets and overhead costs. They debated the impact of whether they should fund a small group of scholarships for some key leaders or they should give money to a larger community where the impact could reach many more but it would be very diffuse. So what I just shared with you is what my husband Rob and I experienced as parents sitting in that room watching the discussions and I have to tell you we were filled with pride and joy because our goal to connect our children and our friends children with Israel and with Jewish philanthropy was coming to life before our very eyes um, and that's really what the Acharai Fund is all about. Felicia shared with you some of the reasons behind why individuals form giving circles. And it's the same with us. We wanted to have greater impact. We wanted to see and feel and touch the programs that we were interested in sharing our resources with. We wanted to increase awareness and funding specifically for Israel because we knew in our community the funding was decreasing. And most importantly, and I can't stress this enough, we wanted to share our passion and our connections with our children. And so the Acharai Fund was born. Acharai means follow me, and we are not the first to use that name, nor are we the first to do a giving circle. But what's different about the Acharai Fund is that we're a multi-generational giving circle where our children are responsible for choosing the funding area, vetting applications, and ultimately selecting the recipient of one of four five-figure grants. And our children, our next generation, they not only do a wonderful job, they love doing it. So I'll give you briefly um, a little bit of the tachlis about the Acharai Fund. We were started in 2011 with 36 families. It just happened that way. It was meant to be. Um, we all live in Philadelphia, but we don't all know each other from before. We are a completely volunteer organization, and 100% of the money that we raise goes to the organizations that we choose. We ask each family to give $5,000. It's the same across the board. And we give grants exclusively to programs and organizations in Israel. Our Ahrai Fund members developed our website, created our logo, um, created our evaluative criteria, our grant guidelines, even our LOIs, with some help from Felicia, I must admit. Um, but we did it all ourselves, and we're a very diverse group. Some have been involved in the Jewish community for years. Some have never written a check to a Jewish organization. Some have lived in Israel. Some have never been. Um, we have one rule. It's called the no jerk rule. You have to know how to play in the sandbox to be a part of a giving circle. My husband has a different name for it, but that's my name for it. Um, we're fortunate that the Jewish National Fund is our fiscal sponsor. 
which means we didn't have to start our own 501c3. We all write our checks to JNF. They give us beautiful tax letters, and they take no overhead, no admin costs. So basically, Acharai is all about community. It's about community between families, within families, between peers, between parents and children. It's beautiful, and it's wonderful, and we really do make giving fun. We do social events. We bake homentash in each year and de deliver shalach manot. We have Shabbat dinners where we cook all together, um, and we just went to Israel, but I'll share more. I just wanted to tell you that our members, young and not so young, um, participate in every bit of our evaluations and our vetting processes. Our children, the next gen, really take a leadership role. They select the funding category. We use SurveyMonkey. We're not high tech. They decide on everything, every step of the way, and they choose the winners in their category. I will tell you in the first year when we submitted it, we prepared our LOI and I hit the send button, we weren't sure if we were going to get five or 25 or 35 applications. We actually had a bet going. And it turned out we got 71 applications that very first year. And that year, we also had 75% participation with our members in our evaluation process. Um, fast forward four years. We're in the midst of our fourth grant cycle. And um, to determine our awards, just so you know very briefly, we receive the proposals and then we vet them. First, the financial review and then we evaluate by category. And our members participate as much or as little as they want. And then to determine the grant winners, since everyone's in Israel and we're in Philadelphia, we ask the finalists to give us homemade videos, five minutes in length. And we gather together on a Sunday afternoon and we watch the videos and we vote. Each family gets one vote per category and the next gen votes for their category themselves. If there's a family that can't come that day or if kids are in college, we have a private YouTube channel so that everyone can watch the Aharai videos and then can vote. So as I said, this is our fourth year. We've made changes and adjustments along the way. And that's part of the beauty of a giving circle is you can grow and adapt together. The exciting part is that we've funded 12 amazing organizations and we have given away already $600,000. By this September, we'll be at 800,000, and a year from now, we'll be at a million. So I just wanna share and close with one image. Um, Felicia mentioned we returned on Wednesday from a trip to Israel. It was the first Aharai Fund adventure. It wasn't a mission, it was a trip with family. And it was five couples, and we visited some of the sites. And I will tell you, if I thought I knew what being a part of the Acharai Giving Circle was before we went to Israel. I learned it firsthand when we walked into the Bet El Israqi Children's Home and 200 kids were singing and dancing and clapping for us because our kids had arranged through their funding to build a dining room for kids across the world. And that's truly um, what being a part of a giving circle is all about, so thank you. So my <clears throat> one of my first experiences with Jewish philanthropy, when, it's, when I was 16 years old, my friend in high school, Evan Barron, said, hey, my dad got tickets for this Israel Bonds dinner. Shimon Peres is speaking. So Evan schlepped me. Uh, we, he didn't have to schlep me because we were both big Israel lovers. And we went to the Hilton Hotel in that huge ballroom. And we sat there uh, at a table of people who are probably in their 50s and 60s and 70s, and we were 16 years old, but we were so excited to hear Shimon Peres speak. He was the Prime Minister of Israel. And up on the dais, we saw Shimon Peres, and then someone else from Israel Bonds got up, and they started to name names. And they started to go through the Hilton Ballroom naming names. Moshe Schwartz, and then Moshe Schwartz would stand up. And about 20 minutes, and like, what's going on here? We, we came here to see uh, Shimon Peres speak, the Prime Minister of Israel. Uh, we realized what was going on. We weren't so smart, but about a half an hour into naming names, we knew they were making our way. And when the guy sitting next to me stood up, 
I said to Evan, it's time for us to go. <laughs> so we skedaddled out of there, and, by, and when we were in the lobby of the Hilton, I heard David Steinhardt, David Steinhardt. And that was one of my first experiences with, uh, I guess, Jewish philanthropy. And it's really nothing against Israel Bonds. I'm sure they're great. But for people of my generation, I just can't imagine that mode of uh, philanthropy, that mode of getting people excited uh, uh, would work going forward. So I'm curious if they still do it that way. Um, so I want to tell you just uh, for a couple minutes about Natan. Natan was started in 2002, which is now about 13 years ago. And basically a friend of mine came up to me and he said, you know, I want to do my own thing. Um, let's do it together. It would be f more fun if we, I think it was just three or four of us, put our money together and we all sort of care about broadly Jewish causes. So let's start our own thing. Um, there was no master plan. All we knew is that we wanted to do our part to strengthen the Jewish people. And by the way, we had never heard the term giving circle. That's something that I think I heard just maybe four or five years ago for the first time. So we started Natan, and then going a little bit down the road, we had attracted maybe 15 or 20 people. We decided we needed to create some sort of construct, some parameters, just to say we're going to give, put our money together and then randomly give it to you know, what one of us wanted to do here or there. It didn't make sense. So we needed some structure. And when you go down the world of, uh, don't go down the path of Jewish philanthropy, there are a lot of things you can give your money to. And I remember someone wanted to give their money to the IDF. Someone else said, no, we really need to help the impoverished Jews in Latin America. And someone else said, no, we need to fight anti-Semitism around the world. All good causes, but you can't do everything. So we had a big meeting, probably a number of meetings, um, and there was debate, should we focus on Israel, should we focus on the U.S., the world? Uh, we were gonna, we're, would we focus on large grants? Would we decide, you know, if we raised $100,000, would we make 10 grants at 10,000? Or would we, you know, make uh, a, a few big grants, a few small grants? So we had this debate. And not everyone got their way, but we did reach some conclusions. That sort of became what the structure of Natan is today. We would focus our grant making on the U.S. and in Israel. Um, in the U.S., we decided that our focus would be on strengthening people's Jewish identity. In Israel, we would focus on economic empowerment. Also, we decided that we wanted our, our grants to the organizations we gave our money to to make a difference. So we decided to focus on small organizations, budgets under $1 million. Since then, we've upped that to a million and a half today. So when you give your money, charitable donations, to organizations with budgets that low, you know you're taking chances. Small organizations, but greater risk, and in our views, greater reward. One other point. While we were making these grant-making parameters and deciding upon them, we decided uh, that we didn't want to make too many rules, which in the end, looking back, was a good thing, to keep it loose. Because things change. Every year you might have a different, you know, things come up. And I recall at least one year when a sterot in Israel was being bombed that Natan, our, our group, came together and said, we need to make an emergency grant to the people of sterot, even though it wasn't really you know, a normal Natan-type grant. So now, 13 years later, if we look back, a lot of good things have come out of Natan. Some we anticipated and had hoped for, and some we had no idea would happen. So I just wanted to highlight some of both some of the things that we hoped for and did come to pass. Today, Natan is 80 members, and we've given over $10 million of grants away. We have a rigorous grant-making process that makes us confident that our money is well spent. We've networked amongst our members. You know, some people want to join so that they can, you know, make networking friends and for business purposes. Um, and of course, we've made new friends. We've organized educational events and we've had fun. And then there are other outcomes, which were probably none of us anticipated uh, in the beginning. But I'm quite proud that they occurred. And some of these are members getting inspired to give Jewishly and learn from our grant-making process and educational events. Members joining other organizations, which they met through Natan, 
Sometimes they'll even leave Natan to join these other organizations. That's okay with us. People coming to us to start Natans in other places. We've had people approach us and say, hey, you know, your model is really great. Why don't you help us start Natan <laughs> London? Start Natan San Francisco. We haven't done that yet, but it's something we talk about. Uh, Natan has acted as an incubator for new ideas, such as what Felicia was talking about before, this group called Amplifier, which is a partnership with the Schusterman Foundation. Uh, basically promoting this giving circle platform as a way to get people excited about giving. And finally, our members feel like they get a good deal when they join Natan. The way, if, if you join Natan, I think the price is $18,000, but if in joining a committee of giving away money, you end up making decisions of giving away hundreds of thousands of dollars. So you really feel like you're getting leverage on your, your donations. So a summary of Natan as a giving circle can sort of be summed up in the following words. Giving, getting a good deal, learning, meeting new people, and having fun. That's the power of the giving circle. Thanks. The Jewish Women's Foundation of New York imagines a world in which all women and girls in the Jewish community are ensured a healthy and supportive environment, a world in which we all have equal opportunity for economic, religious, social, and political achievement. The Jewish Women's Foundation of New York works to make this world a reality by providing education on vital issues, funding innovative programs, engaging in advocacy efforts, and encouraging our donors to view all philanthropic efforts through a gender lens. So I begin every meeting uh, with our grants committee reading our mission statement. That was our mission statement for the Jewish Women's Foundation of New York. And it just, um, I wanted to share that with you just as a way to root you the way we root our grants committee in what we imagine. I love the wording here. I'm, I could break it down for us, but we won't. But um, it's just really um, to Im imagine this world for Jewish women and girls. Uh, so the story, the origin of the Jewish Women's Foundation is a pretty good story. Um, there were about seven, uh, five women um, on the seventh floor of the UJA Federation building who all walked out and were chatting in the bathroom about uh, this meeting they were in and just wishing there was a way to um, highlight some issues for the w Jewish women and girls and some projects and some organizations and thinking to themselves, there must be something else out there. And thus began uh, the, this giving circle or the Jewish Women's Foundation. Um, and this is about 20 years ago. Um, and we are here now with about 375 members, um, all women from the New York area, from Long Island to Westchester. Um, uh, and just to paint the picture, there are about two dozen Jewish women's foundations or funds uh, across the country. Um, and uh, we have done some partnering with them and we could talk about that in a bit. Um, so our foundation, um, the data is, the, the age range is 35 to 85 about. Uh, you, um, become a member of the foundation with a donation of $2,500, or uh, that's the minimum. We have no maximum. Um, and that allows you to uh, be part of any of the grant-making bodies that we have on our foundation. Um, we have, um, we fund social change, so we are not looking for direct service or so social service, and we have three buckets that we look at when we're funding the women and girls issues. So it's economic security, leadership advancement, or health and well-being. We fund in the New York area, we fund in Israel, um, and we also have a, give, a giving circle about three years old that funds um, from Nepal to Africa um, and actually just helped out with the um, earthquake recently. So that also uh, funds more worldwide. Um, this year, we gave away $460,000. Um, and the grants range in size from 2,500 to 100,000. So you really have um, whichever either 
I, we call them grant committees. E each one can really be seen as its own giving circle. Um, but depending on where you sit is um, how much you're funding and where you're funding. Uh, but the buckets are actually the same on each committee, if that makes sense. Um, and I will, I am going to be brief, but I would say um, our biggest challenges right now are kind of still publicizing the great work of our grantees and what we are doing. Um, we had a annual luncheon today, which went very well. Um, we also do advocacy work um, in addition to the, the grants that we make. Um, and I would say the highlights for me um, as working on this foundation up at this point are really the range of the women who are sitting on these committees and the range of their opinions is constantly astonishing, as you can imagine. Um, I love meeting these grantees and their projects, the women who come through, and that we are all focused on women and girls um, to me just adds an extra layer of meaning because truly what I see, uh, my husband makes fun of me that anything that is Jewish or women or in Israel, I mean, I would just blindly fund anything, uh, which is partly true and partly what I love about this work. But I also see it as really fulfilling the, the long tradition of Jewish women who've always changed this world, right? From the biblical women we have to the modern women today and that we are just in the line of, of doing what Jewish women have always done, of spearheading projects and fulfilling meets vote of our Jewish tradition and, um, and this opportunity to be on this grant making uh, body is, is what I love most about it. Thank you. and um, I'm a member of Solalim. Solalim was founded in year 2000, 15 years ago. Uh, the original genesis of it was uh, I and some others were involved with the UJA and we were having problems uh, getting certain young people to commit to, or not so young people, our age people, to commit to being philanthropists or get, getting involved or giving Jewishly. Uh, many people wanted, didn't want to give to a big uh, mothership or, or had issues with uh, overhead or whatever, and so we started a group to, to say, okay, well, let's do it ourselves. And we started with, I think, nine families at first. We each committed to putting $50,000 and make an annual commitment of $50,000 a year for three years. We wanted to make a, a three-year commitment because we were going to make grants uh, that would uh, more than one year grants to particular organizations so we had enough corpus to uh, so that we can we can do that <clears throat> and <clears throat> now 15 years later we've gone through five cycles of this so we, we kind of went in without any idea what we were doing and now 15 years later we've we've been doing it for 15 years we've made about 60 grants to um, and given away about $6 million over time. Uh, the way we go about it is uh, we have the UJA as our uh, helping organization. Um, a professional from the UJA, and a couple of them are here this evening, are kind of our agents in helping us find causes that are interesting to us and then helping us administer those grants and monitor those grants. Um, and we paid them a fee. I heard before that JFN doesn't charge anything, so we're going to have to take that up. JNF, excuse me. <laughs> Pardon me. But, um, uh, but we, we uh, uh, UJA uh, provides us resources that are invaluable for us uh, to accomplish what we're trying to do. <clears throat> we vary what we meet at the beginning of a year and try to uh, put our heads together as a group and, and see what our priorities are. We've, we've funded a very diverse uh, list of, of causes over the, over the years. Sometimes we're very uh, particularly focused on an issue and very often it's, it's wide ranging and whatever um, we bring to the table. We're also very interested in what the community is doing. So uh, leaders from the UJA will come and speak to us about what their um, needs are or their focuses are 
and very often we will find some kind of common ground or interest in some of their projects and try to support those or enhance those or take those in different directions. Uh, we also have done grants in conjunction with other uh, foundations that are like-minded and we do matching grants so we have you know all sorts of all the tricks of the trade to try to get the most out of the money that that we're we're giving um, our grants as I was saying before are a maximum three years uh, when I when we give a new grant we will guarantee money for only one year but ideally if uh, if the cause is living up to uh, our expectation we will continue to fund it maybe in varying amounts over time um, and what will happen is we'll make a grant to a, a new organization. They will come back and see us after a year, sit at our table, explain what's going on. We'll have the opportunity to kind of uh, catch up on if we think they're doing valuable work and if we're still supportive. And if so, it's our uh, hope and desire to continue a grant with that organization for three years. <coughs> very often these organizations or the, the charities that we're funding are very young, similar to what David said. They're, um, speculative ideas. We came into this on the concept of venture philanthropy, but uh, uh, meaning we were willing to take risks and wanted to start organizations that maybe can blossom and be something well beyond what they, they were starting with. And, um, and that, that is who we have funded primarily. What also is a big uh, driver for us is a dynamic leader. The person who, whose idea it is and who runs these foundations um, is often uh, our, our hook into why we want to be involved. <clears throat> All these people who are interested in will come and meet with us. We'll go site visits with them if, they're, if their organizations are here in, the sta in, in New York. Um, but we'll have a chance to really get to know the founders and the people running the, these charities. And um, when we're captured by the leader, it's often uh, a charity that we want to, that we end up supporting. Um, so uh, we, when we started the foundation, we had an idea that each one of the families would sit on the boards of these organizations and get close to them and provide services and therefore report back to the other members in, in the group um, to give an inside look on how the, how the charities were doing. We kind of dropped that over time because it, it found, we found that and I found we didn't really have the time or the, the um, or, or we weren't adding enough value. On the other hand, we do like to support the organizations we're involved in, in helping them more than just giving, granting them money, but trying to help them come up with a, an approach or a cause or helping set direction for them. And very often we'll um, approach organizations with an idea that we can jointly develop. So it's become more than just uh, you know, a, a mo monetary gift. <coughs> And even though we support foundations or, or charities for only three years, um, the members of this group have fallen in love with a lot of the charities that we have supported. Um, and if we've supported 60, we've seen hundreds. Um, and uh, my wife and I, just speaking off uh, personally, have become very, very involved in one of the particular charities that came through us just as, a, as another potential grantee. And even though we've, we've now funded them three years through Solo Leem, but it's now um, a charity that's near and dear to our heart and we spend tremendous amount of time personally in addition to our other philanthropic efforts uh, just involved in that, one, in that one group that came through us through this effort. So uh, speaking personally, the, the benefits that uh, I have gotten out of this is I, I really do think that we've made um, important and worthy grants and therefore the money that uh, we have given away charitably has been very well spent and in on, on causes that might not have been able to get off the dime um, if it weren't for our money. So I think we've done good that way. Um, I believe personally I've become a much better philanthropist or understand I'm more knowledgeable about what we're supporting and um, understand the lay of the land on how one should give and and um, and also have become a much more committed philanthropist because of this, because of the psychic and, and other benefits that, that I and we all have gotten from this. Um, one of the great, great things that I've also uh, gained are incredible friendships. The, the families that are part of this group with, with 
with us I did not know going into here, into this, and they are now some of my closest, dearest friends who I can't respect anymore. A really, really sensational uh, group of people. We love being with one another. We've done this as uh, some of these other groups have. We, we, we have five families, 10 families sit around the table and divvy up a pie with 30 and 50. You know, it's much harder, I think, with, with bigger groups. But we, after, at first, not knowing one another, it used to be a little bit of a battle, how to, you know, who to, you know, uh, whose way would, would we get. And now we can honestly complete each other's sentences. And when groups come to see us, we know right off the bat um, if they're going to appeal to our group and or who in the group really has expertise that can lead us in a discussion to try to figure out if, if this is a worthy cause or if this is a, the right time for us to kind of invest in them. So, and, and that really is a part of this whole experience that has been very meaningful and very, very gratifying. And so I, like some of the others here, really think this giving circle concept has been a wonderful experience and is an important experience go forward. <coughs> um, we've, had, we've had some pushback from the UJA over time, just speaking off the cuff, because um, they prefer general giving, which I very much um, uh, support and understand the place for, even more so now having been able to ourselves give individual gifts that are to our liking. Um, but in the world now where foundations are growing up and more and more money is going to be given individually or through giving circles, um, I, I believe we're just on the cusp of more of these being formed and there needs to be a great, uh, which I encourage and am anxious to support um, and also um, help people learn how to practically do this because we've got, gained a lot of experience after 15 years of of how to pull this off or how to, su how to succeed. Um, but I also think it's a time where there's going to be more coordination amongst giving circles so that we, these groups, can work together on certain causes. And family foundations and other big philanthropists will now get involved with us. And um, I just think that uh, there will be much more, as, as more of our type groups sprout, there will be much more coordination amongst us. And I think that's the next, the next thing that, that that's in front of us. So, thank you. Terrific. So, um, thank you to all of the panelists. We're going to have a moment, a uh, few moments, where you can ask your questions. I just wanted to note that David said when um, that he first heard the term giving circles just a few years ago. I think the same is true for me. And I love the way that Cliff kept referring to Solalim was as a foundation. That's the word that we always use to talk about Natan, and you have Jewish Women's Foundation and Akharai <laughs> Fund, right? Um, giving circles, I sort of, I love the term because it's a catch-all, but I don't love it because it actually doesn't capture how incredibly powerful this model is. Each of these folks is part of a foundation, and giving circles open up that experience of sitting on a foundation board to anybody at any level of giving, giving to any kind of thing. And that's the power of the model. It really can reach anyone. So we'd love to take some questions. Yes, please. Um, Debbie, do you want to answer the investment question? And maybe the, the annual contribution the one annual as well? Contribution. You can oh. use a mic if you want. Okay. Um, okay. The, the, annual, okay. the annual contribution is that we try to keep the minimum. We actually are going through a couple phases of um, of now establishing a minimum because we were a membership organization and there was life memberships and kind of converting that model. So it's the right question. And right now, we would say if someone wanted to become a member, you know, we'd really want the, the minimum would be a $2,500 gift because that enables the, you know, to keep the, the voting kind of in, and engaging in the giving circle equal. Um, you can give more. That's okay. <laughs> That's always okay. It's always okay. Um, and as far as investing, we are uh, work, we, we are building more of an endowment um, and have putting some aside and investing that, and that has been going on for years, and we are 
you know, trying to focus, actually, we're having many meetings lately. We switch financial advisors and all of that. So we, uh, we have been doing that and we are doing that a bit. Um, I, as far as I know, nobody else has an endowment. I mean, not at this table, or am I wrong? No, we don't have an endowment, but we, we all contribute the same amount of money every year. And if we find causes that, um, that we love, we, we'll spend all of it or most of it. If we don't, we'll, let, we'll have it carry over. And then next year, when we get the next crop of, of charities coming to see us, maybe we'll spend, spend the money then. So the amount we give every year is variable. We are sort of actually, um, this is now the third or fourth time that we've done panels like this um, at different conferences usually and in different, um, we are taking it a little bit on the road. The, one of the answers to your big, big question is on your table. It's the next steps sheet um, that anyone who wants to learn more about Giving Circle, certainly more about any of the individual circles that presented tonight or just in general about Amplifier and the resources that we have to help anyone start their own Giving Circle, um, a lot of the information that you need is on your sheet. Jewish Communal Fund, of course, um, is a great resource to you. I also just want to make sure um, that we um, shine a spotlight on a few other people here who you can talk to, Joy, uh, who I'm just shining a spotlight while you're in the middle of talking to your mom. Um, Joy <laughs> runs the Jewish Communal Fund of New York. Um, Joelle Berman's here from Natan, and she's a program director now of Amplifier. Um, Laura, I'm going to mention you, Laura Spitzer started Sololim, was a staff person at UJ Federation who started Sololim, low those 15 years ago. Um, and Susan runs a program now, right, at UJ. Anyone else who I'm missing? Okay, great. So there are lots of people who you can talk to, and we're happy to come anywhere, pretty much. Joelle is happy to go pretty much anywhere, talk about giving circles with anyone. It is really a model for just, for any generation, but especially for those people, as David told the story, who don't want to do the traditional fundraising, who don't respond well to that, and who really want to get their hands dirty and really want to have an active role in their philanthropy and do it in a community of people and have a lot of fun. So on that happy note, um, we really want to thank you all for coming tonight and thank the panelists, and we hope to talk more.